Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Getting Data Quality Right, sponsored today by Calibra. It is the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Data Ed. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And to open and access either the Q&A or the chat panels, you may find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send you just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording and will likewise send a link to the recording of this session, as well as any additional information requested throughout. Now, let me turn it over to Henry for a brief word from our sponsor, Calibra. Henry, hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Thanks for the introduction. And hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, and Good, good night from wherever you folks are from. Um, my name is Henry Tram. I'm a data quality specialist here at Calibra. The reason why we're sponsors today is we're extremely passionate about data quality, data management, data governance in this space. And we're here to introduce Peter what some of the things we've been seeing in the space as it pertains to your organization, whether it be SMB all the way up to the enterprise. Data is exploding, as you can imagine, right? The IDC predicts that there's going to be 175 zettabytes of data by 2025. And as you can imagine, managing all of that data is extremely difficult, whether it be entering data from your front end offices in your CRM or your HR systems, back end offices, working with financial data, accounting data, trying to reconcile data and make sense of it all, all the way up to management, to leadership, thinking through how do we report off of our organization, right? Off of our data. How do we make data-driven decisions on a day-to-day -day basis? And get to the quality of the data, trusted data in real time, right? And as you can imagine, in terms of every employee in your organization, whether it be an everyday employee, there's a lot of questions that are pertaining to data quality issues, right? How do we run our own data quality checks? And where do we get started? And what are the unknown unknowns? We've been reporting off of our financials, off of our transactions for quarters and years now, but what are the potential pitfall and anomalies we haven't considered in itself? All the way to the BI analysts and the data scientists, how do we track whether or not data quality is getting better or worse over time? And where are the inconsistencies? Where do we start with our data cleanup project? And management and leadership, how do we make data-driven decisions if we can't trust the dashboards, if we can't trust the BI in reporting, if we can't trust some of our financial figures. And as you can imagine, all these questions are driving a lot of operational headaches and costs, whether it be a 50 to 70% of the time spent on manual rule writing, 15 to 25% lost revenue due to bad data, and $1.9 billion in data quality spend, perhaps being manual, perhaps hiring new FTEs, trying to make and create manual processes to manage all the data quality. Right? And that's exactly how Calibra Data Quality can help, right? Leveraging technology where business and IT can collaborate on a self-service fashion built in with ML and AI into the platform. Where it gives you the ability and the easy button to have auto-generated rules, adaptive rules, rule discovery to automate that rule writing process, but also being built on a modern Spark architecture, right? You folks can scale at ease and really taking the framework to be more proactive in data quality rather than being reactive, right? Really partnering up people, processes, and technology to build a scalable framework for your organization to not worry about any data quality issues that come into play, right? And the last slide before we introduce Peter is just an overall comprehensive end-to-end -end data management and data quality platform. Right? When you think through the needs and the functions and the capabilities for your organization, from the backend IT analyst all the way up to the business user, to have the simple point-and-click functions to be able to run data quality checks within minutes, you're going to need an end-to-end -end comprehensive enterprise solution. Right, And you can start small, scale fast, again, data quality within a couple of weeks, reducing the time to data quality there, but out-of-the-box workflows to be able to navigate and sort through data quality issues as they progress through your organization there adapting to any specific data quality rules, again, out of the box rules for your organization for ML and AI, but also the ability to create custom rules and automate the rule application process, creating rule libraries and semantic rules to apply to new data sets as you onboard. 
Again, as your organization, your data goals change, you want automated ways to detect changes as well. So it's schema drifts and source to target validations for data reconciliation there. And always running profiles over time and having ML study those profiles uh, over time. So studying and, and giving you anomalies in terms of what you need to focus on in itself and being able to integrate with all your sources, whether it be the Snowflake environments, the AWS, the Azure or GCP world, or the on-prem sources in itself. So really taking the framework, uh, marrying it with technology, and being able, to, being able to build out a scalable processes in your organization in a very simple and easy fashion, right? So all these things we discussed, I'm sure Peter is going to elaborate more on. Um, just keep us in mind, happy to have a conversation with your organization, talk through how we can help your organization in your data quality projects and partner up with your organization there. Shannon, Peter, that's all I had. So over to you. Henry, thank you so much. And thanks to Calibra for sponsoring today's webinar and help making these webinars happen. If you have any questions for Henry or about Calibra, he will be joining us for the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar today. And now let me introduce to you our speaker for the webinar series, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter is Acknowledged Data Management Authority and Associate Professor Professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, President of DAMA International, and Associate Director of the MIT International Society for Chief Data Officers. For more than 40 years, Peter has learned from working with hundreds of data management practices in more than 30 countries, including some of the world's most important. Among his 12 books are the are the first making the case for data leadership CDOs, the first focusing on data monetization and on modern data, on modern strategic data thinking, and the first to objectively specify what it means to be data literate. International recognition has resulted from these and a pre-COVID intensive worldwide event schedule. Peter has also hosts the longest running data management webinar series from dataversity.net. Yes, you have. It's 10 years now. I can't believe it. Starting before Google, uh, before big data was big, and before data science. Science, Peter has founded several organizations that have helped more than 200 organizations leverage data. Specific savings have been measured at more than 1.5 billion US dollars. He's His latest is anything awesome. And with that, let me turn it over to Peter to get his presentation started. Hello and welcome. And thank you, uh, Shannon. And thank you, Henry, for a nice getting us started on that. Yes, you're absolutely right. These uh, themes are absolutely lock solid in step uh, going on to this. So we're going to talk a little about Popeye today and uh, several other things as we go through this, but I figured Popeye was sort of the main character uh, on this. So we'll uh, dive in here and, and talk about what we're going to talk about. And the first third of this really will be looking at what you have to think about as you are starting to approach data quality. Then the second Third is what do we need to get better at? And this is not really well understood. Uh, again, buying technology like Calibra is an excellent way to address this. In fact, it's difficult to imagine doing it without some sort of technology support uh, around that. And it's been wonderful to work with Calibra over the years and watch as the product set has matured uh, all the way around that. The last part of this then, we'll talk about how do we get better at what we're doing. So it's really a matter of getting started and then getting better in the process. So let's uh, dive in and look at when one approaches data quality sort of from the first time, how does that tend to manifest itself in organizations? And it's kind of fun living as long as I have, I guess for a number of different reasons, but you know, even back in the 90s, we asked questions. So I, I wrote these words in a, a book called Building Corporate Portals using XML back when we were focused on technology. And I was very fortunate to write that and do that work with Clive Finkelstein, who we acknowledge as a, a leading uh, visionary in this particular field. And the, the part I wrote down was uh, fixing data quality problems is not easy. It's kind of a, a challenge uh, in that sense because it never tends to look as simple as it does from the outside uh, when you're looking at it. It can become dangerous. And I've seen people who said, gosh, Peter, I know you I know you know I'm passionate about data and I thank you for getting into it. But as soon as I started exposing some data quality problems, man, they came after me. Yes, that is, is likely the case. And that your efforts are unfortunately likely to be misunderstood, not through any specific fault, but mainly because we're not practiced enough with the vocabularies that we should be using in this context to help speak with people. And you'll see some examples of that as we get into the presentations. Uh, in addition, you could make things worse. 
Now, we've observed in our studies of members at DEMA International that people tend to start out in the data world by starting out in IT or the business. And after a while, you start to realize that, gosh, if somebody could fix the quality of this data that we're working with, things would be easier. Now, that's all the promise, by the way. Easier is still better than harder, but nevertheless, we can't, uh, of course, fix everything. And eventually, in your organization, somebody turns around and says to you, I'll just pick on Henry as an example, and say, Henry, you said data three times in the last couple of weeks. You must be the data person. So guess what, Henry? Now you get to fix the problems. And of course, that's a, a really sort of daunting thing. And people then look around, start Googling, find Dataversity webinars and other places that you can go for this and, and perhaps even stumble across the Dimbach and start to get a, a handle on what's going on in this area. Because a single data quality issue can grow into a really significant, unexpected investment in that. Now, the place that most organizations are going to these days is the latest buzzword, digital. Everybody wants to go digital. Now, it is kind of interesting, and I, I want to quote my, my friend and colleague Mark Johnson on this, who uh, actually invented this little equation. He said, you know, I see what happens when I subtract data from digital. I'm not sure what I have, but I do know if I do it the other way around, I subtract the digital from data, I still have data left over. And of course, that is critical. Uh, it is impossible to go digital without a good foundation in high quality data. And yet, so many of these initiatives that I have observed over the years, and remember, in our profession, we consider that one in three projects succeeding on time with full functionality within the schedule promised with low risk to the organization as successful. Uh, again, if my dentist was that successful, I would certainly find another dentist, but we have not matured as much as a profession as we ought to. So the reason is, is kind of simple here, and I'll just pop this little uh, quick one minute uh, little session on, on what's happening here. So as you can imagine, bad data plus any awesome thing is still going to give you poor results or perhaps more succinctly as some of you learned it garbage in garbage out now when we look at this what that means is that if i have garbage data and i have a perfect model i'm still going to get garbage results and that's going to be true whether my perfect model is a data warehouse whether my perfect model is a machine learning business intelligence blockchain, AI, it doesn't matter what's in that blue box. And it's always true that garbage in is going to give us garbage out. The challenge is though, most people don't really understand that fundamental piece. So until we can start to look at our data flows in the organization that are often duplicated and can save very significant amounts of dollars very quickly by just normalizing your data flows, we can't even evaluate the results that come out because until we get de decent results out of it, we're not gonna have anything else. So once again, bad data plus anything awesome is still going to give you bad results. Let's dive in for a couple of definitions here. Our definition that we collectively use in the industry is that data quality is data that is, excuse me, quality data is data that is fit for purpose. Uh, thank you, Martin Epler, for coming up with a really good definition. And of course, it has to be synonymous with information quality. Many organizations will try to distinguish between the two, but if you understand properly that data is a combination of a fact paired with a meaning, and that information is data that is provided in response to a request, you'll understand that you cannot do information quality without data quality as well uh, in there. So let's stop arguing about it and understand the relationships that are there. So the next definition is then data quality management, planning implementation control activities that apply to quality data management techniques to measure, assess, improve, and ensure the data quality. This means it encompasses a variety of different life cycles that we go through, and we'll look at two of them uh, in particular today. And it's got to include supporting processes. If you're trying to change the culture in your organiz organization, then of course you need to have change management and organizational leadership around this. Plus, the best thing to think of is 
this as a continuous improvement process, really requiring your organization to develop some core expertise that it may or may not uh, have just at this point in time in order to do this. Uh, now it gets us to our, our Popeye story, and I, I really am quite enamored with this particular one. There was a, uh, uh, a German chemist in 1870 who was doing some investigations, and, and I can assure you uh, that he was very diligent about the process, but he unintentionally missed a decimal point when he was describing the amount of minerals that were inside of the green leafy vegetable we all know as spinach. And so while that's an interesting thing, and he made a, a data quality error, the quality error was that he uh, ascribed uh, 35 milligrams uh, of iron content to spinach through this, uh, again, misplaced decimal point. There were really only 3.5 milligrams of this. And if he had had a solution like Calibra in place, when he moved those results on further, some of the rules in Calibra might have said, do you realize, probably not talking to him in exactly this way, but do you realize that you just said that everybody who eats a serving of spinach is about equivalent to eating a part of a paperclip? I'm pretty sure most of you don't want to eat a part of a paperclip uh, and that you would realize that was a lot. And of course, if there was enough iron in a serving of spinach to have part of a paperclip, spinach would be a very different uh, uh, vegetable in this. So the idea is this got transcribed in there. And again, 100 grams of spinach with 35 milligrams of iron in it. Well, unfortunately, this started a legend. They didn't catch the data error until it actually got back to our uh, Bureau of Statistics in the United States where they went back and said, ah, you know what, spinach is a good vegetable, but it's no better than kale or any of the other wonderful leafy green vegetables that we have. But you can see, of course, the myth around Popeye was that if I just eat this spinach, it's going to make me into a, a, a super person. I haven't seen a Popeye cartoon in years, so I guess I should probably go back and brush up on them, uh, on this. It is a, a wonderful story, and it's a, a really good one because it does illustrate how a single data quality error from previously can carry on and have unintended consequences down the road, in this case, spawning the character Popeye and of course all the myths that go around them as well. Uh, the next definition here, last one for this slide, is, is data quality engineering. And this is the idea that while you're approaching data quality, it's a good way to approach it from an engineering perspective. That means they're not really managed, but you need to develop a approach to them that is based in an engineering discipline. These concepts, however, are not generally known and understood within IT or the business. I can tell you as a, a professor who's been teaching uh, data topics for more than 35 years, I'm pretty sure I don't know of any class in data quality in any U.S. university. There are some in some others, in particular in Germany, that have done some uh, very nice work with this, and I'm sure there are others. One of the things we'd like to do is actually catalog and grab a hold of all those programs. So if you're teaching in a university somewhere worldwide and you have uh, knowledge of these programs that are being taught, we'd like to uh, uh, start to collect them so that we can uh, make these resources known to everybody else. Just ping me. It's very easy to get in touch with me around all of these activities. So now we've got a definition of data quality, data quality management, and again, the approach being an engineering-based approach as we go forward. The reason we need, of course, data quality is from a number of different perspectives. If we're looking at new data analyses, everybody understands that when you do this kind of an analysis, I get the data in some form, and then we clean it and arrange it in some form. This actual slide could have come from my doctoral dissertation back in 1989. The, the, the patterns and the, the process have not changed uh, in order to get them to grouping. And that makes perfectly good sense and is absolutely something that we want to do. But what most people aren't really aware of are the ratio of time that is spent doing this. We also tend to assume that since we have higher data scientists or something like it in our organization, even data engineers, that they will have a pretty good idea of the most effective way, the most effective tools to apply to data quality. And I'm sorry to uh, inform you all that that is simply not true. Uh, we do very little around that in these universities. Here, for example, is my favorite example of this. Data quality tends to happen pretty well 
at the work group level. In fact, it is a determining characteristic of a work group, the ability to share characteristics all the way around. And the gentleman that was just throwing the pink balls at the piano that was on the ground, his name is Wally Easton, according to the internet, is somewhat representative of your organizations trying to deal with data quality. He was perhaps told to go out and learn to play the piano. He did exactly, this is Wally again, he did exactly what he was supposed to do. He learned how to play piano. It's probably not the type of performance that you would want to have if you had a bunch of data people sitting around with perhaps some alcohol at one of our many famous conferences that uh, Shannon and I uh, participate in over the years. Uh, consider the amount of time and effort lost in your organizations with everybody trying to fix data quality problems individually. Uh, it just doesn't, well, it's working about as well as we've seen. And if you're satisfied with the way it's working, you probably don't want to be on this particular webinar uh, on this. Data, of course, over time becomes sand in the machinery. It prevents smooth interoperation and exchange. And we have lots of losses in time money opportunities due to lots of little data cuts that have been up to this point difficult to account for. And one of the things we'll talk about is that while it may not be possible to get a total cost of data quality challenges, uh, it is possible to ascribe some costs to them. And in most cases, those costs are far more than the cost of fixing the data that goes into it. So organizations and individuals lack data quality understanding. And the first place that you can look to in your organization is when somebody pops up and says, data is the new oil. Well, I really don't think that's a good way to think about it. I think you should think about it instead as data is perhaps the new soil. Uh, again, they lack the knowledge, the skills, the, the data engineering, where, how, and finally, we don't have all of the resources in the world, so we need some sort of strategy to say what should we do first, second, and third in order to do this. Again, I mentioned the dirty little secret about data in the world here is that everybody understands we're going to have to do some sort of data analysis and some sort of data preparation. Now, you might ask yourself, would it be fair to say half and half? I've got uh, half my time I spend doing data cleansing and, and cleanup and prep and things, and half the time I spend doing data analysis. I'm pretty sure some of you would look at those numbers and say, gosh, with the amount of money I'm spending on data science and data engineering in my organization, I sure hope they do a lot more than that. Well, it turns out that might be an idealized characteristic where we have 80-20, but it's actually 20-80. Every data scientist is thoroughly understanding of the fact that these data problems are going to consume the vast majority, four times, excuse me, five times the, uh, the amount of time that you're able to spend doing data analysis. So let's just start off with a very simple economic equation from a data quality perspective. If I'm sending this data to be analyzed and I'm spending, oh, let's just say $100,000 worth of it, which is by the way, a very cheap data scientist, um, but nevertheless, spend $100,000 on them and I'm having that data scientist spend four hours out of every five that they work for us uh, doing data munging, cleaning the data. Uh, this is not a good use of that individual. And it clearly would make sense to add some knowledge and skills into this and probably at a lower price point than the data scientists because quite frankly, data scientists have not been taught anything about data quality and they have no experience fixing it, which means they're gonna do their level best, but it's just not the best that could be applied to that particular product. Similarly, we'll also start to recognize as you get into this, and I hope a lot of you have seen this in your own areas, there's something out there called hidden data factories, a wonderful term coined for us by Dr. Tom Redman, uh, the data doc around these things. So a hidden data factory is where you have department A sending off the work product to department B, and department B, rather than trying to crush department A, just fixes the things because it's easier than trying to work across departmental boundaries when we look at that. And they get a hidden data factory there. There's our first one. Then maybe B sends to C and maybe C has the same process. Again, these things happen over and over again. And I didn't get to my one and a half billion dollars in total through any floppy math. It's uh, again, very careful analysis of this. And of course, we hand the product to the customer who also has a complaint. And now we're up to three hidden 
data factories in this particular stream here. Of course, the reality is there are a lot more hidden data factories out there in your organization, and those hidden data factories are causing you all sorts of challenges on that. The problem is you don't necessarily recognize the challenges that are presented because the data, by the time it gets to the place where people decide whether it is fit for use or not, is always filtered through one or more IT systems and one or more business practices around this particular process. And until we connect the dots and see that these things have a common root cause, we will not be able to apply any sort of systematic approach. Again, that's the engineering-based approach in order to do this. So root cause analysis always reveals that there's a data component in every business challenge. That means that from our organizational perspective, we really need to reverse the flow of information there and find out the common root cause of all of these various data problems. And most importantly, it requires us to have a team with specialized skills that are deployed to create a repeatable process and develop these organizational skill sets. So let's take a look now at a couple of things that you may or may not recognize as data quality challenges. I'm just gonna tell you the, the, the things here. It's a letter from a bank, a, a very small rounding error that costs a lot of money, very tangible, a health data story. Uh, something I call the chocolate story, and of course, we'll get into COVID uh, for a little bit as well here. So here's a, a letter I got from a bank. It was pretty old uh, on this, but it still is a very good example. And I'm not picking on SunTrust. They're now called Truist. But the problem was the bank didn't know that they had made a data quality error. And the reason was because we, of course, being a data firm, when we got this, said, hey, <laughs> we called them up and said, did we really get a, 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 a particular gift card here. This is wonderful. Where can we spend this money? And they said, oh, you could spend it on this. And we said, can we buy a car with it? Can we buy it? And it wasn't after about 20 minutes. Finally, the representative from SunTrust said, I'm sorry, did we really send you a gift card for $0? And we said, zero, we thought you sent us a, a gift card for a million and it was just an overflow problem. Uh, but of course it wasn't. They had actually sent us a gift card for a problem. Now, the problem here, of course, is that you should probably have a control in there that says if you're sending things of value to the customer, make sure that the value is not equal to a negative number or the number zero uh, around this. So again, not really recognizing this as a data quality problem. Here's another interesting one. I've been a member of the IEEE, just as I've been a member of DEMA for more than 30 years. And in this case, I was on there just the other day and it turned around and said to me, hey, great, Peter, you've been a member for three minutes and four seconds. Now, I just told you I've been a member of this organization for 30 years. I think that also counts as a data quality error, although they would tell you, oh, well, no, this just means that you're a member of IEEE TV, which is a sub membership category of the membership in the IEEE, and you've been a member there for three minutes and 44 seconds. Well, again, confusion also counts as a data quality error in your customers' minds, because if they look at this, they will not understand A, it's a subsection, and B, that you're only counting part of their membership, in which case you should say a better message, more informative message around all of this. Here's an article from the Seattle Times here, where they were building a new port. You may have heard of some <clears throat> Supply chain difficulties recently? Yes, of course. And the error here was that they needed a trench for an electrical cable, and the trench was specified to be 2.52 inches. However, when it was transferred from one piece of paper to another, it was truncated and now has a specification for this cable of 2.5 inches, which meant it was not big enough. That small two tenths of a hundred. Uh, uh, inch output here cost them a million dollars that they had to go through and divert and wait until it was corrected. Again, these are not what you'd think of as typical data quality errors, but I contend, of course, that they are. Now we get to the chocolate story. And one organization that I worked for for a number of years uh, tried to explain to them that if you're trying to sell chocolate at the same time as you're trying to change your systems, it's 
probably not the best way to do this. Uh, this. And we made that story a cultural touchstone within a meme, if you will, within the organization. And so I know I've succeeded in this when people come back and say, oh, Peter, are you getting ready to tell us the chocolate story again? And that's exactly what you want to hear because they know the chocolate story. Now, of course, what I do is I say, great, I've told it a bunch of times. You tell it to the people here in the room who have not heard this particular data quality story there, which was simply the fact that they spent so much money on their IT. When it came time to sell chocolate at the holidays, they delivered their chocolate to the wrong places. So customers were not able to access their pounds of chocolate that they were looking for. Uh, again, another quick story here out of the UK in this case, uh, wonderful, Isaac Klein did a, a great blog post on this one, where in the UK, apparently they have 17,000 pregnant men. What's going on? Well, somebody miskeyed them. And how often do you think any of us look up at our medical records and double check the metadata that is on our medical records? Not much at all, but on the other hand, if you get a, a letter in the mail that says you need to come in for your latest OBGYN uh, exam and you're a male, you're probably going to maybe somebody confused something somewhere. Yes, and of course, that's exactly the answer uh, in this particular instance here. Finally, one last one. Those of you that are using Microsoft Excel understand that there are, of course, challenges with it. In this case, there is absolutely no reason why a healthcare worker on the front lines in the middle of a pandemic should have to know which version of Excel files they are share, uh, saving. Nevertheless, in this case, well documented here again, they were using an XLS file instead of an XLSX file. The XLS file stops counting rows after 65,000 and the additional data is dropped without notification. So they managed to underreport. They managed. They went back and did a, a oopsie on this and what happened, and found out that they had underreported 50,000 cases uh, that were going on and lots and lots of other things. Eight days of in incomplete data. This is, I'm certain, not the only time this happened in this. So you've seen that data quality errors manifest themselves in all sorts of different ways. I'll show you one other data quality error a little bit later uh, in the presentation here. But let's talk specifically about data quality. And again, a, another area that this is not well understood is that there are two aspects of data quality. There is what we call practice-oriented activities, and there are structure-oriented activities. And all of them have to be correct in order to get fit-for-purpose data. So practice oriented might mean uh, that we've, uh, again, not told the frontline healthcare workers not to keep track of data in an XLS file, but instead to keep it in an XLSX file, which is hard enough to say, much less train health workers uh, in order to do this. And this allows incorrect data to be collected when the requirements specify. Otherwise, data can be presented out of sequence. These are all practice oriented things that help with that particular process. But on the structure oriented side, it means the data is arranged imperfectly. And I had an interesting uh, uh, example of this in class last night. I had a, a student that wanted to take an exam and they needed a little bit extra time on it. So I set it up so that the student could have the extra time on the exam, but it turned out the attribute was at the quiz level, not at the student taking the quiz level. So the data was arranged imperfectly and that student got cheated out of some time. Another example might be that your data is organized by street address in which you really need your GPS coordinates or your data is captured, but it's not accessible. Yes, that does happen on a regular basis uh, in these uh, big data warehouse giant things that we've seen uh, over the years. Similarly, when incorrect data is provided in response to a correct response. One of my favorite ones was that I had a group that I was working with. We had a Likert scale. The data should have been between the values of one and five, and they got an average of seven. Well, if my range is one to five, I cannot get an average of seven, but the computer was giving it to them. So they said, well, it must be that the computer is right because we're obviously not as smart as a computer. Obviously, I strongly disagree with that. One of the reasons we're in this shape, this, this particular situation, is the data is not broadly or widely understood. It's like the blind people facing the elephant, depending on which part of the elephant that you touch, 
uh, you will come away with a different perspective of the entire elephant because you're only seeing a little bit of it. And data is very similar. Some people think warehousing, some people think it's visualization, storytelling, et cetera, et cetera. These different ways of manifesting are big and challenging. Uh, again, when we look at this, here are some images, again, memes here, and you can see that in certain cultures, they have loathe and hate versus hate and loathe, uh, sorry, loathe and love, uh, scary and reassuring or not, uh, and again, high-heeled shoes are pain or pleasure, depending on what's going on. All of this is obviously going to be related directly to the context in which you're looking at here. It helps in organizations if you have what we call a burning bridge. Here is a very specific example of a burning bridge. This is uh, Zion Williams, who is getting ready to play a brand new basketball game, and he's got a brand new Nike sneaker on. When and watch Zion what happens. Zion Williamson's Nike sneaker busted open on the court less than a minute into Duke's Wednesday night game. The star forward went down hard, and so did Nike. The company's stock sliding on the news, closing the day down nearly a point, losing an estimated billion dollars in value. Well, this is, of course, the burning bridge. Something's going on here, and we need to go back and find out what is the data root cause of this. Now, Nike originally didn't look at this. They thought it was a shoe quality, a manufacturing quality program. But when they tried to go back and find out what actually happened, they, of course, immediately ran into data. And then they found out that the data wasn't necessarily theirs. It belonged to some of their suppliers. So they had to do all sorts of things. Somebody needed to go in and fix the poor quality. And luckily, with the burning bridge, you've got somebody's attention. But it's also important that you make sure you don't have just their attention, that you take this time to educate them about this. Again, use the examples that I've given you here so far just to illustrate to management why all of these things are burning problems for the organization. Typically, what happens is management says, okay, you're right, I got it, go do something, which often leads into buy something. Well, again, buying technology is absolutely necessary, but it certainly can't be the only uh, stage. And if you are a fool and you have a tool, you are still a fool and the tool is not going to be as useful. So make sure that you get what it is they're trying to do. Something does get accomplished, but most often all the project funding gets used up. The early cases that we're looking at in data quality have a dual purpose. You need to make sure that the case will fix the immediate challenge, put out the fire, figure out why that sneaker busted open and, and make sure that it will not happen again. But you also need to illustrate why you can't be done with this by Friday. Data quality cannot be approached as a project. In fact, data quality complements our goal in all of this of leveraging our data. So if I have a 100 kilogram weight on one end of this, any one kilogram weight on the other side, you can see it's obviously going to do this. But when I add some tools and technology to this, I can now start to make it work more correctly. Adding in a larger weight on the other side of the fulcrum here will actually make it work a little bit better. In fact, if I add more, I'll get even better leverage around it. But there's other ways of getting leverage. When we look at it from this perspective, here's our organizational data. And we have some technologies. Again, something may and it almost always is necessary on this. Then we look at what is the technology. Well, in the example that I'm using here, there's the fulcrum, which is the lever. And I could use just the lever to move that organizational data on the other side of it. But of course, you understand the other part of the technology is the, uh, I'm sorry, I said the lever and the fulcrum. The fulcrum is the purple thing that, that the lever is on. And that's, of course, how you properly leverage your data in order to do this. We've got people, typically they are knowledge workers, sometimes they are supplemented by data quality professionals, sometimes they are not. Uh, and again, we need a process in order to do this. We can't just have people repeating Wally Easton's wonderful performance. So notice we've got our triumvirate, people process and technology there, guided by some form of strategy to say these things are more important than those things, whatever they happen to be. Finally, we'll get to a, a bit where we talk about rot, data rot in this, and that we will understand that reducing data rot will help us increase data leverage as we go forward uh, around all of this. So data leverage is a multi-use concept, but it permits organizations to manage the data better within the organization and with our partners that we're changing. Of course, all of this in support of the organizational mission.
Then we have leverage, which is obtained by this data-centric skills uh, and processing technology, focusing in on this non-rot data. So it's a type of data. We'll get to that in just a second, but be assured that the bigger the organization, the bigger the leverage potential exists in the organization to do this. So treating data more asset-like does two things simultaneously. It lowers organizational IT costs because IT spends between 20 and 40% of all IT spend working on data challenges around this. And it increases our knowledge worker productivity, which is the biggest source of untapped productivity that we have in our organizations. One more specific concrete example of data leverage comes from the Master Data Management Initiative. And the little yellow dot that I have in the upper right-hand corner here of this slide is what we call reference data. It's not a lot of it, but it's important to get it right because reference data tells us what values our databases are allowed to contain. They may address questions like the countries where we do business, the types of accounts that are available, the controlled vocabulary items that we're going to use. And this leverage then expands to a way in which we can now go to master data, which again is a subset of all of our data. So master data might say, are you a member of our premium or our VIP club? Are you even authorized uh, to use this or to, to be a user on our system? And are we using common data standards across this? Because of course the master data controls all of the rest of the data that's out there. And if we don't have this correct, it means when somebody comes along down the road and says, well, I'd like a transaction for five bucks, or uh, I'd like to be authorized, or I'd just simply like to like something, right? Each of those are database calls that we're going to make. These are the instances of values. And you all of a sudden have to go back to the board of directors and say, uh, we can't do business overseas because we didn't control our reference data correctly in order to do this. We can't determine the country of origin of our product because we never captured that information or we can't add a foreign language to our website because we didn't plan for this. So again, a little bit of leverage controlling an awful lot of data around all of these. Uh, these examples are from my colleague, uh, Chris Bradley, who's done a great job of helping to articulate some of these things. It's got to come down to a fairly simple math proposition in management's eyes. If X is invested in Y, then outcome Z must be greater than X. Uh, again, if I invest 100, I want to get at least $101 back out of it. Of course, at the beginning of the project, where the parties know least about each other and, and least about the data quality items, we're expecting to agree to the full meaning of price timing and functionalities and, and defining X some resources, Y cleaning one set of data, and Z that the outcome is that the data set will be clean. Most managers go, I'm sorry, you lost me. Uh, you know, it's just not very interesting here. But if I instead go back and say, no, 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 no. I invest X, I clean one set of data and I can save a thousand dollars, but so what? Changes to, I really care now. Right, And that's what we're trying to do is to get management's understanding in this. So what does it mean to have a data quality program? Well, it's an ongoing commitment. In fact, you are unlikely to not need a data quality program. Let me say that in a positive way. Your data quality program needs to be around until your organization decides to close up its doors. That you're gonna have some governance in here with some senior level control and direction in here that you need to make sure that executive management understands that when they run into an organizational business challenge, they need to think of data quality as a part of the uh, problem and therefore it has to be part of the solution almost immediately on this. And our data quality approach in a programmatic say un inherits a budget senior management attention, somebody who's in charge of it, and reasonable timelines and expectations. Again, we don't want to do this and then suddenly say, by the way, you can have it done by Friday, right? Well, that's not going to work. So data is not a project. It's a durable asset, and that asset has a useful life of more than one year and represents something that we want to put additional uses in so that we can reuse it. And while reasonable project deliveries might be 90 days or two weeks, depending on what we're doing, our data evolution has to be measured in years because data evolves. It is typically not created on a project initiative by project initiative basis. And it is significantly more stable than other parts of the organization. Certainly the process architecture uh, in this case will always be more 
uh, influx than the, the data here. This means that what we need from a data quality perspective is to produce ready-made data architecture components that should be a prerequisite to agile development here, because the only alternative is to create a bunch of additional data silos. And I've already said this again, the difference between projects and programs is projects have a start and a finish. We do not believe that data quality will ever finish at the organization. It might not be needed at such a high or intense rate, but we absolutely do need to make sure that we've got it in there in order to do this. Let me give you an example of bridge maintenance. So in New York City, they've done a great job of taking a look at their bridges and staffing them in a way that makes perfect sense. They start painting, and when they paint the entire bridge, they go back to the beginning and they start over again. Wow, because they know how long that paint's going to last and how long it's going to take them to paint it. So as much as they do this, it's also the same way they maintain this. They've thrown it into it, a regular process that they can repeat. And it means they will have a workforce that really does understand this in the longer term. And suddenly I'm transforming from bridges to sandwiches. What does this have to do? Well, most organizations, the problem is there's an uneven amount of literacy, uneven amounts of data supply, and very limited use of standard in the process. So we try to harmonize these things, make them more compatible with each other so that they will work because you're dependent on high performance automation. And high performance automation cannot happen without engineering and architectural components. And I had to go all the way to in, uh, excuse me, India in order to get this particular thing. It was a Deming quote on the cash register at this very uh, tea farm in India that said quality engineering and architecture work products do not happen accidentally. Yes, absolutely. And if we add the word data in there, of course, it is even more true. Let's take a look at it from an engineering perspective. Here's a really good example of something that is engineered. It's one of my favorite objects in the world. I'll give you a couple of attributes. It's taller than I am. It has a clutch. It was built in 1942 and it's cemented to the floor. Why might you do something like that? Well, the answer is Oh, and by the way, it's still in regular use, which is kind of interesting, uh, more than uh, 80 years after it was originally built. Of course, it lives on the USS Midway, which is harbored in San Diego Harbor, and they regularly use the kitchen of this wonderful uh, piece of history to have uh, parties and things like that to celebrate the museum. But of course, the other part of this is we were sending 4,000 warfighters out there to fight in World War II, and the last thing we wanted them to have was be hungry. So we wanted to make sure how can we guarantee that we will make sure that these folks have uh, breakfast every morning as well as other meals. Well, this is a very large piece of equipment that is engineered so well that unless the ship sinks, it's probably going to be able to work. And you can contrast that with a very wonderful KitchenAid uh, 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 version, something like I've got downstairs in my kitchen here, but there's no way that I could make pancakes or breakfast for 4,000 warfighters. The duty cycle of the small red engine is not going to be up for what it needs to be. And you can see the duty on the other one looks actually a little bit more like a, a drill press uh, in order to do this. I'm actually speaking to you from this location here in beautiful Western Hanover and in, in outside of Richmond, Virginia. And I, what I'm showing you is a barn that we built. I'm what's called a horse husband. So part of the process was uh, making sure we built a barn. And in the process of building the barn, I borrowed money from the bank. When I borrowed money from the bank, they gave me exactly this much money and said, you may not construct anything until we have inspected this. The challenge around this, of course, is that it makes good business sense to make sure that you have a good foundation in place, but there is no IT equivalent in this. And that's why we have to be focused on quality engineering around all of this. So what do we need to get better at? Well, let's take a look. First one is systems thinking, which is the idea that we have to be able to see both the forest and the trees, but that we can't fully understand any sort of challenge unless we understand all of it. Here's a good way of looking at systems thinking very briefly using what's called an input output diagram. Here's our input, there's our process, there's our output. And very simply, if my process is called make pizza and I have dough and water as the inputs, we understand for sure that calling the output pizza is probably not going to work. So how can we make this work? Well, we can say we're not going to make pizza, we're going to make pizza dough, pizza crust. Terrific. 
that works out a whole lot better. And you guys can all see the example. We don't have sufficient inputs in order to make the outputs that we want. And that type of engineering would no longer be called make pizza, but instead make pizza crust. Data storage needs similar understanding, particularly if you're looking at quality problems. Where did these inputs come in? What level of quality is required by my processes? What role does quality play in my processes? And where do these quality attributes get used by future customers downstream, as in next minute, next hour, next day, could be a number of different things. You can also see that data quality is interdependent with other types of things. So for example, I might have data governance and data quality as I'm doing an initiative around customer relationship management, uh, perhaps. And that would indicate that, as I mentioned before, the dim box here, this is our visual representation of the dim box. And we may look at this and say, well, we may think we're doing a data warehouse, but it's very unlikely that we're going to do a data warehouse without approaching data quality, although I have seen it done in many cases, and also without doing data governance as well. Now, another important category for getting better at this is the idea of understanding the also 80-20 rule applying to wheat versus chaff or data versus non-rot data. So let's take a look at how that works out here. When we look at what's going on here, we can first ask the question, does organizing data add to its value? And I think it's a very easy answer yes to this by looking at some pre-information age metadata as in I'm making a book. And if I make this book and I don't include page numbers, alphabetizing the various indices and things and diagrams, it's not going to be a very useful book. In fact, a real easy way to watch this process is to take the spine off of the book and distribute the pages. You'll see very quickly the information coming from this becomes ephemeral. So better, better organized data does increase in value. And 80% of what we're looking at here is rot, data that is redundant, obsolete, or trivial. So the question becomes, why should I clean data that doesn't need cleaning instead Cleaning part of my data is a much more effective approach than trying to clean all of it. And of course, who is better qualified in order to decide? This is not the seminar for it, but there is a approach to this called structured uh, uh, approach on this. And the idea is that there's a relatively well uh, thought out method that goes behind this. Uh, there's no proprietariness or anything at all about it. I do like to use this in the context of the theory of constraints, which says that in any system, there's something that's blocking achievement of goals. And the more you can eliminate those blockages, the more efficient your cycle will be. In data, we should take exactly the same approach. And by the way, if that theory of constraints cycle down there looks a little bit like the Deming quality circle, there's there for a reason. Yes, Deming cycle, plan, do, study, act is the way Deming created it. And many people actually say plan, deploy, monitor, act. It's the same cycle. We're just doing different labels for it. And the idea is, of course, let's do some diagnostics. What is going on? How can I scope these things? What do we need to do to address those pieces? Did I fix the problem? And let's take some additional action because even if I did fix the problem, I now need to know what is the next problem in order to do this. These life cycle models are very problematic. We tend to look at them and say, if we're starting data at new development, that's where it starts in the upper left-hand corner there, and you can see travels the entire cycle. But if I'm starting for existing systems, I instead go to the bottom right-hand corner and do my uh, cycle there. So again, people don't even know where these things go. And this is a very good way of examining all of those bits and pieces in order to do this. There are a number of data quality attributes. I'm just gonna put them all up. Architecture mo model value and representation quality. And of course, on the left-hand side of this diagram, if I'm trying to do my work there where there are more representations of the data that I have, it's kind of like being in a boat at the bottom of Niagara Falls and trying to fix the data quality problem. Yes, we're closer to the user so we can achieve more architect, but our structure problems are much more about let's plan the architecture for what we need in order to do this. So how do we get better at the process? Well, let's take a look at the conversations that we have. Engineers want to say, I want to clean some data, but the business wants to hear, decrease the number of undeliverable targeted marketing ads, All right? Reorganize the database, increase the ability of the sales force to perform their own 
analyses. Develop a taxonomy, is what the engineers say. Create a common vocabulary for the organization. Optimize a query. Shave one second off a task that runs a billion times a day. Yes, those seconds add up very, very quickly. Reverse engineer the legacy system, something I would, of course, say. Understand what's good about the old system so we can formally preserve it and what's bad so we can improve it. And our data leadership, our CDOs, chief data officers that we want to have, should also be focused on these things as well. Inventorying, whoops, I'm sorry, inventorying the data uh, in order to do this and uh, coming up with the first version of a strategy and monetizing that. And monetizing maybe for making money, but also for putting a cost on how much it costs us to do things poorly. Now, I say strategy on this because of course, nobody has all the time and resources they'd like to have. We've started using the term in about the 1950s, but the business consultants turned the strategy into a plan. If you go back to the origin of the word, it's actually a process a pattern in a stream of decisions. So when we look, for example, at a choice, if we've got ability to improve operations or innovate using data quality, both of which we can do, um, probably we don't wanna not do data quality. So let's do data quality, no problem with that. But if I'm over here in quadrant two and I wanna be very effective, everybody would agree that Walmart is the world leader in terms of being efficient and effective. And Apple perhaps might be the world leader in innovation uh, around this. But what we can't do is both of those things simultaneously. Instead, what we should do is get some savings from this and use that savings to start initiating other types of topics. It also helps that we educate management about math. If I'm in a 48 bed hospital and I have a quality problem of the beds are becoming scarce, that would be three of them on Monday, six of them on Tuesday, 12 of them on Wednesday, 24 on Thursday, and 48 of them on Friday. What are we going to do tomorrow? You want to catch that way before it happens. Now, all of this falls into a category of making sure we're all singing off of the same sheet of music. And while I love Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band uh, on this, there's no way that they could play the volume of songs that they do and things that they do unless they do an awful lot of practicing. And that's what I'm saying here is really critical is looking at the practices here. So we've talked about how to approach data quality and I've gone through a number of different considerations. We've talked a lot about what do we need to get better at in order to do this, which is not understanding the data quality in isolation, looking at data rot, not under understanding the way in which culture plays a role in this and developing repeatable practices. Finally, we need to refocus whatever conversation we're having in business terms. Make sure that we've got some leadership around this topic, that we have a programmatic focus as opposed to a project focus, and that at least our management understands the simple math, key performance indicators goes in right there, and that we've gotten good at storytelling around that whole process. So as we head back to the top of the hour, getting ready to invite Henry back in to get your questions and things, I'm just going to sum up with a couple of uh, quick uh, bits on this. And that is the idea that most people, when they talk about data quality, they go up and they put up a wonderful slide like this that say, high quality data is critical. I absolutely believe it. But what does it mean to be transparent with your information? I still have never found a good definition of the word analytics, business intelligence. But increasing efficiencies and decreasing costs, these are not helpful unless we actually put in place something that will be meaningful to this. So rather than just go with the platitudes that are offered by many of the offerings that are out there, let's talk about some very specific pieces in here. One, the first project needs to be relatively small. The project should not be allowed to begin unless the data requirements for the entire project are verified. Two, the product owner must be highly skilled. We need to have people in place that can do this. And very few in IT or the business have the requisite skills and knowledge around data quality. You'll need to do some socialization in there. And one of my favorite things to do is to take somebody who comes to me and says, I can't quantify this. Can you help? And yes, we may not get the full cost, but I can definitely get to something that will be recognized as important. The process must be agile ready. In other words, to implement in this, we need to have a construction technique that we can get ready for. But we don't want to do this without the right type of planning. So data requires more planning before we actually start constructing. 
Uh, number four on this, the team must be highly skilled in both data quality process and technologies here. And again, few teams have this requisite skill in order to get started. Finally, the organization must be skilled at an emotionally mature level. Uh, if the management is just going to say, I don't care what you do, I have literally been locked in uh, computer centers and told not to come out until we fix certain issues with this. Some of them can be fixed that way, some of them can't, but most organizations really don't understand this data stuff. So the approach that we're looking for here really says data things happen on this side. What we've got to do is translate that into organizational things happen so that while we can celebrate the data things happening, we need to quantify the organizational things in order to happen here. Um, again, lots and lots of uh, things around this. Uh, the real key to this, we've gone through the overall process. I've included in here with you the specific values on this. And Shannon, I actually ran over by 20 seconds here, but we're coming around to the top here. Got some upcoming events on this. And uh, again, let's invite Henry back on and see what sort of questions you guys have in order to get us a little further down the line. Sarah, thank you so much for another great presentation. If you have questions for Peter and Henry, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen. And there was a question that came in here uh, earlier, um, Henry, during your uh, presentation about Calibra. Does Calibra automatically suggest explainable rules that span across several fields? Yes, the short answer is yes. So Calibra offers out of the box roles with ML and AI, such as behavior studying profile statistics over time, outlier studying group buys and keys and data uh, over a, a time bin. So time series, so whether it be quarters over days over months, and then it aggregates transactions and it points out exactly what it sounds like outliers, right? And other functions as well. So there's a number of out of the box functions uh, in accordance and um, associated with a data and it's data agnostic as well. So you, you run it through the test, you run it through the checks, it scans, it studies, it learns, and it's going to give you potential anomalies based upon your data in itself. And Henry, if I can add one thing to that too, that I know Calibra does, Calibra has studied the process of collecting this type of data and extracting it. So that not only is it a, an a initiative, but you're also gaining from these centuries of experience that exists within Calibra in order to try and address these kinds of problems. And I really do think you guys don't play that aspect of it up quite a bit. The product <laughs> is really quite mature. Yeah, uh, th thanks for that, Peter. Yeah, our, our adoption services and our programs here, and to your point, a lot of the things you're talking about a bit about is and what we call adoption is, you know, reducing that time to data, right? How do we incorporate and have organizations on board with some simple data quality uh, projects and metrics, right? And then be able to um, not have to reinvent the wheel and roll that out to the rest of the organization. So typically we take a number of use cases for a business unit and we roll out data quality to there. We prove success, we get everyone on board uh, within 15 to 30 days. And then the adoption there is just incremental and it's also um, exponential at that, that the moment, right? At the juncture, because again, a lot of folks are excited about the tools. Uh, it's very simple in nature, but it's also comprehensive, Peter, to your point, where uh, folks are finding data inconsistencies on a self-service basis, whether it be missing values, null values, and kind of going backwards and you know, not boiling the ocean, but taking the project at bite sizes at a time. How do you eat an elephant, right? One bite at a time, exactly right. <laughs> All right, Shannon, what other sort of questions do you have? And just uh, I've missed uh, answering the most commonly asked questions. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday for this webinar, because yes, you will get a copy uh, or a link to the slides and a link to the recording as along with anything else requested throughout. So diving in here, Peter, there's a couple questions around ROI. So um, I am the BI analytics manager at a higher education institution. I spend at least 50% of my time addressing data quality issues that impact our ability to use BI assets with consistency and accuracy. Getting resources allocated to data quality projects is very difficult, but perhaps equating those issues with cost would help. Can you share more about how you calculate the cost of poor data quality or direct, uh, if you have links to resources on that? Um, your slide on simple math kind of addresses, but how do I calculate the cost and benefits of a particular data quality project? 
So the, the method around that, if you will, is pretty straightforward. I'll give it to you an example of the query that I spoke about earlier. Uh, again, I have looked at organizations that you can see from my resume. I've got uh, literally thousands of hours working with some of these groups. And you take a simple query that runs uh, literally billions of times a day. And when you look at that query, I just said, can I take a look at it? And it had never been optimized. Uh, it's not a skill that is taught most SQL individuals uh, in order to do this. And so consequently, they don't think to do it. So we took that query and saved a second off of that query. Well, a billion seconds a day added up to machine time and run time and even electrical costs uh, that we were able to do on this. And I'm giving you a very trivial example. There are lots of others that are out there that can look at things. And I have a, a small pamphlet called Monetizing Data Management that's out there at Amazon that will give you some more. It gives you 17 different patterns of how you can see if these patterns apply to you and then what measures that you use in order to do this. I did one at uh, one company starting justifying a data quality initiative by saying you have thousands of IT workers. If we could make those IT workers just one hour per year more productive, that added up to the cost of being able to purchase a technology uh, in order to do this. And again, as Henry said, you, we don't start out by saying we're going to fix it all, uh, certainly not by Friday, but what we do do is say where things are going to start getting better. And as it gets better, we will be very careful about making sure that we have a website internally facing so that we can go up and post successes because everybody's going to say, yeah, you did great for me last year, but what have you done for me lately? Well, again, if I can go out there and, and say that, you know, we shaved a billion seconds and that billion seconds translated into a dollar value X or uh, we were able to, in the educational situation, perhaps push enrollments up. I know that one of the things all institutes of higher education are terrified about is something called the enrollment cliff that is coming up. Uh, what we've seen over the years is that our people who forecast students coming to universities are good, but not great. And so the question of how do we play out different scenarios with the enrollment cliff can actually have an awful lot to do with this. We may find, for example, that uh, while there are going to be fewer students, those students that are remaining would be more motivated. And I'm diving into a very uh, topic specific example on that, but there are lots of others out there as well. Henry, maybe you have some uh, examples of an ROI calculation that one can be done because you said uh, we've got the ability to come in for these proof of concepts in there. How do you justify value at a very short time? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I can tell you experiences from both being a a data quality consumer of a product. Uh, I used to work as a business analyst. So, you know, for us, we can, we have specific processes and procedures in our month on close, right? Working with financial master data management teams. So that took us about three to four uh, folks for a single entity. And we quantified that workflow and that process to be about 20 to 30 hours in, in a given month. Right. And that's for, again, five to seven tables within our enterprise and our databases. So when you think about the scale, again, we just quantified it from a blended rate of X dollars. And, you know, that's taking our teams a lot of time. What happens when we acquire another? Uh, we, we're doing some NMAs and we're acquiring more entities. Right. What happens when we're onboarding more data sets? And as you can imagine, 2X, 3X, 4X, 5X to data. Right. Your scales and your challenges are going to grow in, in accordance. So quantifying the data quality issues in our world when, you know, with a Calibra, um, quite simple when we start thinking through big data volumes and onboarding data sets. Right. So that's from the perspective of being a data operator there. Uh, from a data quality perspective, again, when you quantify the amount of time it takes for rule writing or when it, it takes amount of time for folks to adjust the data and run through Python or SQL rules or whatnot, again, it, it's very lengthy. So again, that's another way to quantifying from the back in IT administrators. And from just a business use case, there's a lot of folks we work with, to your point, the additional zero, the, the fat fingering, the additional characters. And you know, with the banks we work with, every return credit card is about $50, right? And again, if we are able to resolve those data quality issues and again, multiply it in accordance to how many issues we run into, again, that it, it's kind of a simple calculator from that perspective. And I think we have somebody from MasterCard in the audience today who might or might not want to share the <laughs> number of credit cards that come back on a regular basis, but rest assured, it's a fairly large number. Yeah, absolutely. They add up after a time. So it, it really is the process of saying, what can I quantify? 
can I make this to the point where it will come up in a, in a very significant uh, amount of time? I had another uh, quality piece that, that I did where we were moving data from one organization to the next. And most of the way that happens with consultants is that they hand the subject matter users a spreadsheet and say, write in the field and the source system that it is in the target system. And while that is a good start and it's certainly information that we wanna have, it does not in fact address some of these data structural issues. In fact, it can make them significantly worse. Uh, again, the, the example that I mentioned earlier of not having an attribute at the right level in the hierarchy uh, in order to do that reduces our control. If I don't have language specifications in the reference data, there's no way I can add it to the system after I build the system. So if I might do uh, business in a foreign language, how long is that data quality error going to hurt us? Well, if it means my uh, um, uh, initiation and, and time to money in the market is delayed by a year, that's a pretty easy quantification to come up with as well. And I'm sure that both Henry and I would be happy to, to chat with you on any specifics uh, around this, but it really is a matter of getting started, practicing it, and then starting to add up the cost. You will probably never fully quantify the entire thing, and there's no need to. Once you get it over a certain amount, management's going to say, you're going to save me a million bucks by uh, this time next year, you're on. All right, let's go. <laughs> Perfect. And continuing kind of along similar to the same approach, uh, what is the best? Uh, what's the best approach to remediate historical data quality issues after the root cause has been identified and fixed? It's almost always uh, appear a manual approach is the best alternative, which is usually rigorous. Please advise. Well, it's tough to tell from the the scant amount of data you've given us about the specific challenge. But certainly there are going to be times where you want to do things. One of my favorite data quality efforts, so I'll go back to Tom Redman as well. He taught me this many years ago. He calls it the Friday afternoon aha moment. Now, of course, he would like to have a little bit of uh, perhaps uh, adult beverage included with this, but then let's just sit around for you know a couple of hours on a Friday afternoon and examine the quality of the data that we keep about our top 10 customers. And on that Friday afternoon, I guarantee you, you will find some, wow, I didn't realize that was going on. We call them a, 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 a you know, a small business where they're actually an enormous size, but yeah, all sorts of things will be wrong with these top 10. And if these are the number of quality errors that we found in our top 10 customers, imagine what the rest of it will look like. That, by the way, makes itself into an instant story that you can then start running up the chain and say, hey, we sat down last week with some technology and looked at some things here and found some interesting potential risks that the organization is facing uh, uh, in order to do this. Should we perhaps take a more serious, more careful look at this? And of course, that's when somebody like Henry would want to get involved so they can help you plan out that particular process in the case of looking at it with a specific technology. Henry, over to you. Yep, yeah, de definitely. And I myself have worked with a number of other data quality products as well, um, being on their their um, pre-sales consulting teams too. And there are different ways, right? There's probably a million different ways you can cook a potato, whether you French fries or potato, mashed potatoes or whatnot, right? A bit of foodie myself. Uh, but here at Calibra, we are very confident. We stand by the ability just to simply be an observability layer. Right. And what it means by that is actually pointing out potential anomalies for your organization in a scalable fashion. So you're running through a scan, there's probably 20 to 40 different anomalies that come your way. And then yeah, as an end user, you want it to flow through a seamless workflow. Right. So what are mission critical things to tackle today? What are mission critical things to tackle, let's say, within the next couple of weeks? Right. And what are things we can get to by the end of the quarter? So again, quantifying and prioritizing the data quality scans. And then being able to assert it through a, a potential workflow and a work stream, right? And then having the end users validate, one, whether or not it's an issue or not, and then save and retraining and interacting with our ML models, right? So it gets, it's going to get closer to what the guardrails for what a true data quality anomaly would be for organizations. So for instance, if there's a potential anomaly that comes in a transaction, that's about $100,000. And typically, you know, your expense transactions for a, a cost center can veered towards maybe about 120,000, you can edit the guardrail and the control there too. Hey, anything over 120,000 is an anomaly. 
anything under under 20,000 is an anomaly, right? But the reason why I bring all this up is because the cost of remediating data in bulk and scale, when you think through pushing back updates, let's say for a thousand records in a CRM and Salesforce or transaction data, if something is off, one little field or mapping is off, then it could be very disastrous for your operational processes, right? So we had organizations who actually pushed those updates. Uh, some of those customer accounts were actually down for a, a couple of weeks because they had to go backwards and see what was wrong. So then there, there's a lot of lost revenue within those couple of weeks, what they quote unquote auto remediation. So, uh, I mean, there's no right or wrong way to do it, but for us in Calibra, we really stand by that. There should be a subject matter expert to dictate and denote that Truly, this should be resolved, or this uh, needs to take another layer of review via ServiceNow ticket. And then you know, our, our stewards can go in in the ETL pipelines to be able to rectify or go back to the source to remediate the data there. Thanks, Henry. And I, I also was reminded of another piece on this, which is one of my bugaboos. I would suggest, if you haven't already attempted it, that your data quality initiative should really be reporting to the business. IT has not proven itself capable of understanding the value ascribed to data. They wouldn't know the difference between a customer number and another set of numbers that might be a, you know, a hashtag on a picture or something like that. And I'm not insulting IT, it's just simply never been part of the remit. And so the business is going to be more able to add to that and to help with, as Henry said, the prioritization of these things and say, yeah, it doesn't matter that we've got the wrong colors in there because what we do, they're all red anyway, you know, or whatever uh, on this. But they can also say, if we're really trying to make sure that we make fire trucks, they have to actually be of a certain size and weight and make sure that they will go over, over rural roads and bridges and things in, in the use case uh, in order to do this. So the business users are better able to articulate, understand, and evaluate the issues around data quality than IT is. And if you have an option of getting your uh, data quality group to report into the business instead of IT, I predict that you will achieve better results. Yep, great and valid points there. By the way, I didn't pay Henry to say that either. So <laughs> <laughs> we just happen to be of like minds. <laughs> hey, so how do you learn to translate data lingo into business translation like the like your slide one demonstrated it, it 